Many people with anatomic spinal stenosis have what is considered to be common back pain. It is the kind of discomfort that occurs upon first getting out of bed in the morning when the back feels sore and stiff, the kind of pain that will come on after doing a day of housework or yard work or physical activities, and the kind of pain that occurs with prolonged sitting, driving, etc. That is not felt to be related specifically to lumbar spinal stenosis, but is more commonly just related to the degenerative changes that occur in the spine as part of aging. There is a second type of back pain that occurs in people with lumbar spinal stenosis that is probably specific to the actual anatomic problem. And this is a type of back pain that is brought on only with standing and walking after two, three, five, 10, 15 minutes and is instantly relieved with sitting down. The classic symptom from lumbar spinal stenosis is called neurogenic claudication, pain in one or both legs that occurs after a period of time of standing and walking will persist while standing and walking continues to occur and then will instantly go away upon bending forward or sitting. Most people will report pain on the outside of the thigh, occasionally extending into the calf, but there are infinite varieties of symptom patterns where some people have pain in only their buttock, pain in the inside of the leg, front of the foot, top of the foot, front of the knee. It can be virtually anywhere within the leg. In addition, some people, about 50% of those with lumbar spinal stenosis, will have symptoms in both legs. Many people with symptoms in both legs will tell us that the symptoms are identical, but other people tell us that symptoms are greater in one leg than the other. The other interesting thing about lumbar spinal stenosis is that once symptoms occur with standing and walking, they will persist. And the pattern in terms of how far a person walks or how long they stand before symptoms occur is quite consistent for most people. A quite concerning symptom for many people is that their legs will start to become numb, feel weak, and their balance will start to become shaky if they continue to stand and walk. This symptom can accompany pain. It is also quite common for people with lumbar spinal stenosis to experience nighttime leg cramps, often in the hamstrings or the back of the legs and in the calves. These are quite bothersome as they really can interfere with sleep. They can occur in one or both legs. These symptoms tend to bother people for a period of weeks and then calm down for many months only to recur again. We thought that the severity of lumbar spinal stenosis would be the major determinant of symptoms, meaning that those people with the most severe stenosis would have the worst symptoms and those with the least severe would have less symptoms. What we have found is that this is not the case. In large epidemiological studies, it has been found that there is no relationship within the population as to the severity of anatomic lumbar spinal stenosis and even the presence or absence of symptoms, never mind the severity of symptoms. And it's fascinating to us that we see some people with profound lumbar spinal stenosis who have occasional and mild symptoms, while we will see other people who have severe, severe symptoms and are incapacitated by lumbar spinal stenosis where their spinal stenosis is only mild to moderate. Even though the severity of lumbar spinal stenosis is not associated with the severity of symptoms, we do know that some people who have been asymptomatic for years will develop symptoms from lumbar spinal stenosis and for some people with symptoms they will suddenly get worse. The interesting thing is, it is very rare for us to see any evidence of any major anatomic change in the lumbar spine that was associated with that change in symptom pattern. The other fascinating thing about lumbar spinal stenosis is that symptom production is not only different for every individual, but it also seems to be different for every nerve root. In other words, People will have severe lumbar spinal stenosis that will compress both the right and the left nerve roots in the lower lumbar spine, but only have symptoms in one leg. Why one nerve root is irritated by spinal stenosis while another one is not is completely unknown. 
For the last two decades, there have been theories about potential vascular causes of symptoms for spinal stenosis. In addition to the nerve roots, blood vessels pass through the spinal canal, including arteries and veins. And with spinal stenosis, there is less room for these structures and therefore the potential for congestion. Even though those theories are quite interesting, they do not explain, however, why symptoms are different between individuals and what changes would occur within the spine that leads to a symptomatic state in a person who has not had symptoms for a number of years. So in conclusion, we do not know why some people have symptoms and others do not at this time. For spinal stenosis, imaging is one of the important ways we help diagnose it. There are a few common findings that we see on MRI that lead to spinal stenosis. Disc degeneration refers to changes in the intervertebral disc, such as loss of disc height, disc bulging, or sometimes disc herniations, that narrow the space for the spinal nerves behind the disc. Degenerative spondylolisthesis refers to a slip where the vertebra above slides forward relative to the vertebra below due to a loss of function of the facet joints. Facet osteoarthritis is a arthritic process of the zygoapophyseal joints where they enlarge. Not only do they function less well and lead to degenerative spondylolisthesis, the enlargement in and of itself narrows the space for the nerves in the spinal canal. Ligament hypertrophy refers to thickening of the ligamentum flavum, these dark bands. In addition to the enlargement of the facet, the thickening of the ligaments narrows the space in the lateral recesses of the spinal canal. This condition, where the spinal canal is narrowed, producing less space for the nerves, is called spinal stenosis. Even in a severe case like this, the patient may or may not have symptoms. One of the things I'd like to stress is if you come to find that you've read your own lumbar spine MRI, please don't become too alarmed with some of the jargon and terms that we use. Many of the words sound very ominous, words like degenerative disc disease, large disc herniation, etc. These don't always mean that you're going to require surgery or that you're going to become paralyzed. These are often much worse sounding than they really are. Approximately 20% of the population is walking around with some degree of spinal stenosis, but rarely does that actually lead to symptoms. The natural history of a disease refers to the progression of a disease in the absence of treatment. And this is very important for us to understand because everyone has to know what will happen if they do nothing versus what will happen if they enter some type of treatment. There have been several interesting studies looking at the natural history of lumbar spinal stenosis. The best of which is a 10-year study of people who chose not to have any treatment for their problem. It was fascinating that after 10 years, one in six of those people had no symptoms at all. Symptoms had completely resolved. And one in six people had really gotten a lot worse over time. But the majority of people had either symptoms that were relatively the same or symptoms that were highly fluctuating. And this is very important to understand. We have observed this in our patients that we have been following for over a decade with lumbar spinal stenosis, and that many have good years and bad years, good months and bad months. We feel that this just reflects some type of change that's going on within the interaction between the nervous system and the lumbar spinal stenosis. Of great importance is that very few people note neurological deterioration over time. It does happen, and we monitor hundreds of people with lumbar spinal stenosis for signs of neurological deterioration, and once in a while, this does happen, leading to the need for surgery. However, for the vast majority of people, this does not occur, and instead, their symptoms are extremely stable.